Good evening. My name is Nick Lees, and I serve as the senior pastor here at Harvest Des Moines, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're here this evening to reflect on the incredible sacrifice that was made by Jesus of Nazareth on the cross. His sacrifice was an act of worshipful obedience to his heavenly Father so that we might be forgiven and brought back into a right relationship with God. Jesus has paid an incredible sacrifice and price to accomplish our redemption, and he is worthy of praise. For those of you who attend our church regularly or our members here, uh, hopefully you received an envelope in the mail this week. And if so, uh, please go get that right now. And if you did not get an envelope, I would encourage you to go get a blank piece of paper. And you can pause the video right now if you need to do that. We'll come back to that and explain why we're going to use that later in this uh, message. Well, as we approach our study of God's Word this evening, and even later on into this Easter weekend, on Easter Sunday, we are doing so from the perspective of the once-for-all sacrifice and nature of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now, have you ever stopped to consider that one death was sufficient for the forgiveness of many men and women? The Jews who were alive during Jesus' time and afterwards would have been shocked by that reality. I want you to try to understand what this would have been like for them. These people were operating under 613 different laws that had been handed down to them by the prophet Moses. They were regularly offering animal sacrifices to atone for their sins. Now you may wonder, what does that mean, to atone for their sins? It simply means this, to reconcile the sinner to God. And you see, unlike how many of us think today, there could be no question that sin and rebellion had separated them from God and that they needed to be brought back into a right relationship with him. And thankfully, God had provided a way for that to happen through the sacrificial system. An animal's life was given with the understanding that it was dying in the sinner's place. God was showing grace and mercy to that sinner by allowing another to die for them to pay for their sins. And so on top of those regular sacrifices that they would have offered from week to week, the Jews also had annual celebrations, two of which I want to draw your attention to tonight, the Passover and the Day of Atonement. The Passover was a memorial by God, of God bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. It was a reminder that God's angel of death had literally passed over them because they had smeared the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home. Again, you see the imagery of sacrificial death. One life given to save another. It's a powerful set of imagery right here. Now the Day of Atonement was an annual event involving Israel's high priest. The high priest would prepare himself to go into the most holy place to offer a blood sacrifice to atone for the sins of himself and the whole nation of Israel. An extensive explanation of that process can be found in Leviticus chapter 16 if you want to read more about it. But for the sake of time tonight, I'm just going to summarize it. You see, the most holy place was a room where God's presence would be manifest to Israel's high priest. That was first in the tent of meeting and later in the temple after it was built. And it was so incredibly dangerous for a sinner to be in God's holy presence that special instructions were even given on what type of clothing to wear, on the type of animals that they needed to sacrifice, and the specific steps that needed to be obeyed before they could enter into God's presence. And then they were given the limitation that this could only happen once a year. Now I want to read a portion uh, from the book of Hebrews chapter 9 to help us understand this a bit better. And so we're going to read Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 10, and I hope this will help us understand the significance of Good Friday. It says this, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section, called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded 
and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second section, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates the way into the holy places is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Now what the writer of Hebrews is explaining here is, he's explaining that there's, these are the ways things worked under the old covenant of Moses. And you need to know he was writing after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He wants the people to understand that the regular sacrifices, as well as the Day of Atonement, those things weren't fully dealt, dealing with the Israelites' sin. There was still a separation between sinful humans and a holy God. And it was dangerous for them to be in his presence without being cleansed from sin. Right? It couldn't have been clearer. We are dead in our sin and rebellion. Or to make it even more personal, I am not holy and I cannot attain the holiness that's required of me in order to be in God's presence. And the writer of Hebrews says their sacrifices could not perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Which means it's impossible for these animal sacrifices to completely purge a person of sin. Can you imagine that burden? Of knowing that you don't measure up to a holy God and that no matter how hard you try, it won't be enough. And truthfully, we should all recognize that. Because it's the same burden that we bear today apart from faith in Jesus Christ. No amount of sacrifices or works can earn us holiness in God's sight. We actually read in the scriptures about God's view of humanity. Let me show you from Psalm 14 what God says about us. It says, The fool in his heart says, There is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Now later in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul repeats that same indictment of humanity in his letter to the Romans. He wants the Romans to understand this is still applicable to you today. And as we study it tonight, we must realize it's applicable to us too. All have turned aside. There is none who does good, not even one. This is speaking of the human condition apart from faith in Jesus Christ. And it applies to both Jews and Gentiles, which means the nations, people like you and like me. And Paul even goes on to say in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the Jewish people continued to make their sacrifices. But they did so in anticipation of this coming Messiah, the promised anointed one who would renew their relationship with God. That was their hope. One was coming who would make all things right again with God. And that is the same hope to which we must cling today. And it's the reason why Good Friday was necessary. We have a sin debt that we cannot repay. And we need a Savior. One who could rescue us from the penalty of our sin. And thankfully, we have the privilege of knowing who that promised Messiah, that Savior is. It's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So tonight, we're going to explore the answer to the question, how is it possible for one death to earn the forgiveness of many men and women?
And I hope that you would agree with me that we are a people in need of a Savior. Let's study and understand how Christ's death was sufficient for your redemption. Now I'm going to read back again in Hebrews chapter 9, this time verses 11 through 14. And I want you to remember the tension that the people were under when they were, were hearing this being taught. Because they know we are sinners and we need a Savior. Keep that in mind as we read. It says this, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The author of Hebrews wants his readers to understand something significant has happened. And while the old way of doing things with the animal sacrifices couldn't suffice for cleaning the people from their sins, now Christ has appeared. And he is a greater high priest who has served in a greater holy place. You see, Jesus didn't enter into the most holy place in the temple here on earth. But he went directly into the throne room of God, right into God's presence. And he did that not by the blood of animals, but by his own blood. He is a better high priest who serves in a better holy place and offers a better sacrifice. And I want you to not miss the author's statement in verse 12. He entered once for all. Or even the conclusion of that in verse 12, thus securing an eternal redemption. We're hearing of the finality of Jesus' sacrifice. You see, unlike the Day of Atonement, or even the regular ongoing sacrifices that were offered by the Jews, Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. And it accomplished an eternal redemption. That's an incredibly powerful and hope-filled promise. As sinners in need of a Savior, this promise ought to bring us great joy. God has made a way for rebellious humans to be reunited to Him. The massive debt of our sin can be repaid through Jesus Christ. And if you go back to Paul's conclusion in Romans chapter 3... Uh, he, he shares the exact same viewpoint as the author of Hebrews. Listen to how he in, in brackets the indictment of sinful humanity with the hope of Jesus. We're looking now at Romans 3, 21 through 26, which says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You're hearing that God's righteousness, his perfect will and perfect ways are revealed to us through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is and always has been the perfect plan of God to rescue and redeem his people through the sacrifice of his son. Jesus Christ, God the Son, willingly entered creation to be this sacrifice. The perfectly righteous one took on humanity and died for the unrighteous ones. People like you and like me. 
Now, I know there's a lot of really big theological terms that have been used in these passages we're reading tonight. We've heard of righteousness, justified, redemption, propitiation. Here's what you need to grasp. If it hasn't been clear already, you and I do not enter into this world righteous or holy. We come into this world kicking and screaming with wanting our wills and our ways to be done rather than obeying God's will and His ways. That's what makes us unrighteous. It's called sin or rebellion. And that's a problem because God is perfectly holy and He cannot tolerate sin. We need to be set free from our sin to be redeemed. And we need to be declared righteous, which means to be justified. And we need that beyond just external purity. That's what the old covenant animal sacrifices accomplished. They were externally pure. But what we need is a purity and a holiness that goes to the very core of who we are. Our conscience needs to be purified from dead works to serve the living God. I mean, we're talking about a fundamental change to our personhood. This is what happens when a person places their faith in Jesus for salvation. Think about it this way. God the Father sent God the Son to rescue and redeem sinners through his substitutionary sacrificial death on the cross. One death for the forgiveness of many. Jesus' sacrifice in your place removes and satisfies God's wrath against you. That's what propitiation means. And all of these amazing benefits are applied to you when you respond to God's call on your life and believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now consider this tonight. If you're in Christ, then Jesus has redeemed you by his shed blood. His shed blood on the cross accomplished your redemption. And there is something incredibly powerful that happens when a person believes in Christ and turns from their sinful ways. Your conscience is purified from dead works to serve the living God. A complete reorientation of your life happens. You want to live and and worship God. Not simply do what seems right in your own eyes. And that radical transformation, it wasn't possible before Jesus' death on the cross. Good Friday had to happen. And so as we reflect on the beautiful yet gruesome sacrifice of our Lord tonight, I'd like to drive home this point with an illustration. Now you may have noticed there's a cross in the background. It's there intentionally. It's there for a few reasons. First, as you look at it over my shoulder... It ought to be a reminder to you that Nick Lees is so sinful that the sinless son of God had to die for me. And it ought to be the same reminder for you. The cross humbles us. It reminds us of the great price that was paid for our redemption and to forgive our rebellion. Secondly, if you do have that envelope that was sent to you this week, I want you to remove the card in it that has uh, the darker background. It says once for all on it. It's got a dark background. If you don't have that, you can grab that blank piece of paper that I uh, recommended you grab earlier and write once for all across the top of it. The purpose of this bookmark is to be a visual reminder of our sin. And so on the backside of it, you can turn it around and just write down if there are any particular sin struggles that you want to lay at the feet of Jesus tonight. You know, we can't be together uh, to do this, but I want to I wanna let you do this from your home. And if you would, take some time here to just write some things down. As you might be able to see, I have a few written on this card for myself. And as you write, I want to read a powerful passage from the book of Colossians to you. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, it says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. 
Now, I know that you probably don't have a cross at home in your living room, so humor me as I take a few moments here just to symbolically nail our sin to the cross. God says that for those of us who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you have been brought from death to life. Your trespasses are forgiven. Your record of debt from your sins that condemned you has been nailed to the cross. He set it aside, canceled it through the death of his son. I want to encourage you to take a moment to just let that truth and that reality sink in this evening. I know you can't be here to nail your sins to the cross, but I want to invite you in the comfort of your home to get creative about how you're going to destroy what you have written down as as a symbolization of what Christ has done for you on the cross, that it has been paid for, it's been set aside, it has been forgiven if you've placed your faith in Jesus. Jesus' blood, his death secured your redemption. Thank you, Jesus. What great hope we have. And I want to give you another passage full of hope. This is from 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, He himself, meaning Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus took your sins upon the tree, upon the cross. Why did he do that? So that you might die to sin and live to righteousness. He delights to rescue and redeem you, to fundamentally transform you to the core of your personhood. This is not about superficial external purification. It's not just so you can look good on the outside. It's about the purification of your inner man or inner woman. To turn from your dead works and to live for the living God. And none of these passages that we've talked about tonight in Hebrews or in Romans or in Colossians or even here in 1 Peter allow you to get around the fact that everyone is first dead in their sin, clothed in their unrighteousness, burdened by their unpayable debt, straying like a sheep. But God, but God has made a way for you to be rescued and redeemed. He did it by the once for all sacrifice of his son, through which he secured an eternal redemption. And if you're listening to this message tonight and you have never acknowledged your need for redemption, then I want to challenge you to do so tonight. There is no escaping the just judgment of your creator. God is the perfectly righteous king. And you have rebelled against him, just like I have. And you can't earn the king's forgiveness for your rebellion through your own efforts or your good works. But he has made a way for you. The king offers pardon of your sin debt through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And he offers to make you new, to clothe you in his righteousness, and to make it so you can enter into his kingdom. But it requires your complete and utter humiliation as you confess that you too are so wicked that the sinless son of God had to die for you. And then you must ask him to save you. That is what every Christian professes. We are a needy people who find our greatest need met by Jesus Christ at his cross. That's what makes Good Friday good. It's the day when Jesus made his sacrifice 
once for all. And the author of Hebrews has a bit more to say about this in chapter 9, verses 23 through 28. So let's look there now. He says, Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The author, again, is pointing out the superiority of Christ's sacrifice in light of its location. He went straight into heaven before God himself in light of its finality, its once for all, and its efficacy once for many. What tremendous truth to remember and to celebrate this Good Friday. We have an intercessor who went straight into heaven to plead with God on our behalf. And he has done so by his own blood after having lived a perfectly obedient life in our place. You see, he did what you could not and what I could not. He not only obeyed the law, but he took on the full wrath of God for your sin. And we know that his payment was sufficient because he doesn't offer himself repeatedly like the high priest used to do with the animal sacrifices. His payment was once for all. And his sacrifice was sufficient to put away sin, which means to remove sin's power and defilement from God's people. So whereas before we couldn't enter into the holy place, now a way has been made. And we even see this in the recounting of the Gospels. Listen to how Matthew's Gospel talks about this in Matthew chapter 27. We're joining Jesus on the cross right now. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. What you're hearing there is that after bearing the full wrath of God for our sins, Jesus gave up his life and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And notice that it says from top to bottom. This is not an act of men. This is an act of God. It's in the passive voice. The curtain was torn, which implies that God himself tore the veil. And it's irreparably damaged. It's not going to be put back in place again. There's no longer a physical barrier to God in the most holy place. Now, Dan Gertner, professor of New Testament at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, says that that curtain being torn suggests that the theological necessity is that it's removed. He says the angelic guardians are dismissed and re-entry into the Edenic presence of God is permitted for the first time since the fall. He goes on to say, the crucial element here is this. All of this is accomplished by the death of Jesus, a ransom for many, whose blood accomplishes the forgiveness of sins And establishes the new covenant. But Matthew insists it's only the pure in heart who see God. So Matthew seems to imply what the writers like Paul make explicit. The death of Jesus accomplishes the forgiveness of sins. And establishes the imputed righteousness of the believer. What you're hearing is that Jesus has made a way for sinners like you and I to be reconciled to God. Once for all. 
His blood was sufficient to make us right with God again. And sinful human beings have an opportunity now to receive forgiveness for our sins and to exchange our rebellion for the righteousness of Jesus. What a wonderful exchange for, for us, right? We reflect on these truths today on Good Friday. We must remember the great cost of our sin, but we must also meditate and dwell on the hope of the cross. It is a bloody day, but the blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins. And God saw fit to apply his son's righteousness to all who would confess their sin and place their trust in him for salvation. Only the son of God could have borne the sins of many. So we say, thank you, Jesus, for suffering in our place. And I want you to notice that at the end of chapter 9 here in Hebrews, it ends on a hopeful note. We're told that he will come again in verse 28. He will come again to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And we're going to talk more about that on Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope you'll plan to join us again online at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, where we'll continue to study the theme of once for all through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Let's pray. Lord, we just come before you this evening and we're so thankful, so thankful for what Good Friday represents. And even though the cross is gruesome and it's a reminder of the, the depth of our rebellion and our wickedness, it is also a reminder of the depth of your grace and mercy and goodness that you would make a way for sinners like us to be forgiven and redeemed that you would make it possible for us to exchange our unrighteousness for your righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your eternal plan of redemption. And may we not take it for granted. Lord, if there are people listening in right now who have never professed faith in Jesus, I pray for them that tonight would be the night where they recognize that they do need a Savior and that Jesus Christ has made a way for them to be rescued and redeemed. Lord, I pray that for those who claim to know Jesus, that this would be a great encouragement to them, that they would remember, my sins have been nailed to the cross. They have been forgiven. I am no longer defined by my past. I'm no longer defined by my struggles in the present. Instead, I am defined by Christ and what he has done. I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am adopted. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.